Comic Book Savant, episode 415. Welcome back to the Comic Book Savant Podcast. I'm your host, James Harris. This episode, I'm doing something a little bit different. I'm doing a comic book discussion. I've done a few of these uh, episodes before. This one is really personal to me. I've struggled with about if I was going to even do the episode or not. I had the concept for this episode for over a year. I had recently talked about this in an episode of Spinner Rack Bros., um, then I was going to eventually sit down and record this episode. I decided to go ahead and do it. Uh, before we get into this episode, I'd like to give a shout out to my co-host on Spinner Rack Bros, Mr. Heath Holland. If you haven't checked out his content over at Serial at Midnight, uh, Serial at Midnight dot com is a website, the official site. Um, then he also has the YouTube channel, YouTube um, dot com, Serial at Midnight. Uh, we do Spinner Rack Bros here. We do an audio uh, portion where a lot of times we focus on comic book related stuff. Um, he covers a lot of pop culture and physical media type stuff. Um, in the latest episode, we did a video episode over on his YouTube channel. We talk about uh, specifically uh, the announcement that the ultraviolet digital um, content locker is going to be closing down in July. So we do uh, a part, it's going to be part one of a series of uh, video content we're going to do over there talking about that and the importance of digital versus physical media. Um, it was a really good episode. Uh, we got a lot of great feedback. I don't know if you guys are aware of it. Uh, we did talk about um, before that we're expanding Spinner Rack Bros. You know, we're going to do, we're splitting content up between audio and video. So if you want to catch all the different episodes of Spinner Rack Bros., you know, you already locked into this podcast and hopefully over to my YouTube channel, um, youtube.com comic book savant and his, um, youtube.com serial at midnight. We're going to, I'm going to eventually do video episodes where we're talking about comic book related stuff as well with him on the, on my YouTube channel where we're working out the kinks on that. But we've done, I think this was our second video uh, episode over on his channel that we've done and all the other uh, Spinner Rack Bro episodes we, we have, you know, in the backlog here as podcast. So definitely if you have a moment, check out his um, website as well as his YouTube channel. Uh, he's doing some great stuff. And definitely if you have a moment, check him out. So I wanted to give him a shout out because he's just doing really good things and big things over on YouTube as well over his um, official website. So if you have a moment, check it out. Um, I have links to everything I can, I'll put them in this episode. And I also, if you go to my links page at comicbooksalot.com, you is linked to the website as well as his YouTube channel there as well. But I'll make sure I, I'll post them and link them in the episode, uh, post on the website as well. Now with all of that out of the way, the focus of this episode is, uh, race and diversity in the comic book industry. Which is was a hard topic for me to cover because, you know, in my, you know, we're pretty much 13 and a half years of being a podcaster um, and doing this, I don't try to get too controversial in anything that, that I talk about. I always just keep it centralized in the importance on in the effect as us all as fans and the industry as a whole. Um, this is just something, this is something that, that came up and it's, this is more not a statement towards society, uh, or anything else. Uh, um, this is mainly about me and, and, um, all of this came about in the lead up to about a year ago when black Panther was going to be released. And, you know, this was like a hot topic. We knew, um, you know, that black Panther was coming out. It was a huge marketing, a huge marketing campaign, being ran and it made me think back as being a black man, African-American man 
and you know in the world um what did i know about black history in the comics industry and it took me down a little rabbit hole of i didn't know nearly as much as i thought and with a show called comic book savant savant you know meaning you know you're you know a a expert or or you know high level uh you know historian type of of a subject it was like that's probably if asked probably would be one of my weakest areas that i know about in the comic book industry so it took me down a further hole of why is that and i don't think it's anybody's fault i mean you you gravitate to what you know and i mean from a very early age you know i think about my first exposure to you know, to comics, I, you know, I, I've always talked about the story of how I got into comics. I got into comics largely because of uh, my cousins. You know, I had a lot of, uh, you know, boy cousins that were, uh, you know, male cousins that were heavily into comics. You know, I was their little cousin. So they would hand me down, you know, different comics. You know, the first thing I ever read that my mom ever told me that I read was a comic book. I've always had comic books in my hand from the age of like two, two and a half to, to this day. Um, I've always read comics. It was something that just was a part of me. Um, but, you know, I think about like pictures that I first had, you know, I, I always, my mom was big about um, in my, in my bedroom as a kid. Um, one of the first images of superheroes I had was, um, I can't even remember what material it was made out of, but it was like this, this, uh, it was kind of like of equivalent of, of, um, what fat heads are now like decals, but it wasn't a decal. It was made out of like a plastic material that you would pin up like on your wall. I can't remember. I can see it, but I, I don't know what they were called and what they were made out of. But like on one side of my, my wall, like where my TV would be in my room on one side was Superman and the other one was Spider-Man. And it was funny because I never really gravitated to Superman, but I, you know, I had it and it was like the thing that she put there and other stuff, Spider-Man, which I always ended up loving Spider-Man, but I didn't care for Superman nearly as much as I liked Spider-Man. But that was like the first images in my head ever that I had of, you know, like superheroes. And then, you know, growing up as a kid, I was born in 75. So growing up, you know, I was exposed to like the, um, Bill Bixby, Incredible Hulk, a TV show that used to scare me to death as a kid. Um, then it was the old um, live action Spider Man like TV show they had. Then the um, the replays of the like the '60s Spider Man cartoon, um, the re- reruns of Bat- the Batman uh, television show, um, you know things of that nature. Super Friends, where we had Black Vulcan. Um, and different stuff like that, you know, it was, it was it, you know, we're, you know, it's, I'm so grateful now that we have so much um, comic book related media that's out there via TV, you know, comics. And it's and I don't want to make this just a black thing because it's not um, again. It made me just reflect looking at my own culture as being, I guess, in a way that I'm a representative of it is, you know, it's one of the things where certain times, you know, I don't think about a lot outside of the love of what I do in bringing you guys the best content. I don't, you know, you guys are as much as a part of me as my family, you know, you guys support me when I've gone through stuff and, you know, all the years you've been there for me, you've messaged me, you've checked on me, when I've gone through stuff recently, like with my foot and my leg and the different, you know, health setbacks and health scares that I've had, you guys have like been there. So, um, I always take what I do lightly, but you know, I never think about things in these finite lines. I just always think about it as us as a community and how I strongly feel about stuff and, and, you know, relaying it to you guys and hope that I spark something within you or you guys feel the same way. You know, I don't think about race and all this other kind of stuff, but it to start making me go in my own head and myself like, wow, it's like, let me, you know, and so I 
was I was like, okay, this would be something good to talk about because it was it it started bothering me because I was like, well, how many black superheroes can I name off the top of my head? So I you know got in front of my computer, start making a list, and I had to really think, and I had to like I like I threw like one or two because you know okay like i said when i first thought about this this was like over a year ago now just you know about over a year so it was like okay luke cage you know i think what season one had not too long came out all the hoopla was around black panther i was like okay check check falcon okay we had him in mcu movies check check um Rhodey, war machine okay we've seen him in mcu movies check check and it was like okay um one of my favorite cartoons justice league justice league unlimited john stewart Boom, boom. Okay, Black Lightning was coming out. And I was like, cool. Okay, yep, that's coming out. Uh, right at that time, yeah, it came out right around that time. So, boom. But they were, you know, these were, the. it was like after that, it was like, I'm kind of stumped. And I had to think. And I was like, well, I'm, I'm kind of done after that. It was like, okay, Luke Cage, Black Panther, you know, Falcon, War Machine, Jon Stewart, Black Lightning. Then I had to think, of like, okay, well, Spawn, the original version of Spawn, Al Simmons, he was an African-American. Okay, boom. That's another one. Oh, Wesley Snipes, Blade. You know, you know, a pretty. it was a pretty big um, movie, you know, trilogy back in the day when we were getting, you know, this whole renaissance that we're on now kind of kicked off with Blade and, like, X-Men. So I was like, oh, he was big. Boom. I had to th- but it, I, it had to take pause before it popped back in my mind. And then I was like, okay, what are the original characters? And I remembered when the new 52 started, they did the, um, uh, African, uh, character, the Batwing comic. And I was really enjoying it. I I think I read the first like 20 issues of it or something like that. And I kind of fell off with it. Um, I I never finished completing the series, but I was like, Batwing, I was like, I really was, you know, he was from, I want to say South Africa. And I really was digging that. He was part of Batman Inc. And they gave him his own book, but it was like, I had to, think and research and then like after that it was like wow like that's all i know and then i thought about it i was like being a huge comic fan as i am i was like how many of these characters i really read in comics and i start thinking about how i learned about these individual characters so when i look back at luke cage i mainly learned about luke cage not from his 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 run in really comics as much. Yes, from the Luke Cage show, but I I fell in love with the Luke Cage character during Brian Michael Bendis's run, New Avengers run years ago, and I was like, that's what really modernized him and brought him into the forefront and made him an accessible character to me. And his relationship with Jessica Jones and all that kind of stuff all built up through Brian Michael Bendis's run. That's mainly how I learned about him. And then I learned more about his history through the television show and, you know, all the advertising and behind the scenes stuff where they talked about his history in the, in the comics um, during that, like, black exploitation kind of craze with the movies. And they kind of made him and, you know, uh, Iron Fist, you know, and that, you know, that whole thing. So I learned as time went on, but the, the core run that I learned about it was Brian Michael Bendis' New Avengers run. I thought about Black Panther. I never read Black Panther. I've I've read a few Black Panther comics. I haven't read any substantial runs of Black Panther. I'm going to tell you where Black Panther first became on my radar. Uh, This was a few years back. I can't even remember how many years, but maybe, oh, shoot, maybe six, seven years ago when they did the Avengers Earth's Mightiest Heroes cartoon. And they had Black Panther, and he was a pretty substantial character. And I was like, man, he's a cool character. Um... And then they did the um, Reginald Hudlin run. They had did like a stop motion kind of cool thing that they did a um, TV show. And that was on BET that I saw. And I thought that was really cool. But it really didn't drive home how cool of a character Black Panther was until we had um, Captain America Civil War. And he put him on my radar. And then, you know, Falcon. It was like I knew a Falcon. I read... I Falcon came on my radar during Jeff Johns Avengers run. And before he went over to Marvel and really, I mean, DC and really blew up, he had a run over at Marvel and he did Avengers run and Falcon was a part of the team. And he just made him a very distinguished type, cool character kind of brought him back on my radar. And then his affiliation with cat and captain America, um, winter soldier. And then he's been in the MC, 
MCU movies since. And I've really enjoyed Anthony Mackie's portrayal of the character, but it was really the MCU films that really brought him on my radar. Um, War Machine is probably the most um, uh, traditional as far as all these characters on this list that I knew of. Because, uh, you know, growing up, being a, you know, being born in the 70s, but really being an 80s kid, I always dug Iron Man. And then, like, around 84, 85, I think Rhodey was, like, really brought into the comics from, you know, being his, like, assistant slash bodyguard and, and rolling out that character and the creation of War Machine. And, you know, he, for a while, he was Iron Man. And then after Tony came back, you know, he... um you know, made the war machine armor and stuff. And he, they really started establishing his character. And so I generically read about this. So this is one character. It's like, okay, I have the, what you would call a traditional, you know, sense of, I discovered him in comics and it has expanded out and, you know, he's been in the movies and, and all that kind of stuff. So it was like, you know, but I started feeling ashamed that it's like, gosh, uh, for someone that calls himself the comic book savant, like when it comes to just something, it's what I, what I thought, when all this start running through my head as something simple, it start being more complex. And I actually, as like, as a, as a black podcaster and a black, you know, it ain't even about race. Let's just keep it real. It's not about race, but it was just like, I felt ashamed of myself because I didn't know these things or I had to think so hard about these things, but I can run off anything about it, you know, pretty much anything about any other character. Um, that wasn't, you know, wasn't of a different color or, you know, the traditional characters are mainly Caucasian male or female characters. And it was like, I don't, you know, I don't, I was like, what other, and it made me think about characters of other races as well. Not, not just African American. And it, it was just like, it like start really bothering me in my heart because it was like, wow, what does that say about me personally that I don't know this um, but anyway, I digress because that's a personal thing. That's something I have to deal with. But I, I felt a, a bit of shame on my, my part that I knew so little. So I looked at the characters I knew about, looked at how I knew, knew about them. And most of them were more because of more recent things or things from other media outside of comics that I learned more about these characters, you know, outside of, like I said, war machine spawn. I read the comics initially Batwing. you know, he's been in, I think one of the, one or two, the DC animated movies, which was cool. Um, but so I learned about him in comics and learned about spawn in comics and war machine, all the other characters, like even blade. I learned more about blade from the 90 Spider-Man cartoon. Then around that same time, those, the live action movies came out, um, and that's where we really learned a lot about Blade as a character. Um, and it took me a little bit deeper into like my, you know, like my childhood, like my parents were, um, my, you know, my parents divorced at a young age. So, you know, I would spend time like summers and stuff with my dad and, you know, during a year I was like with my mom and it was two different landscapes too, because my father still resided in Connecticut where I was, where I was born and I lived for about eight or nine years before moving to North Carolina, where I really resided a huge chunk of my life until, you know, recently. Um, and it was two totally different climates when it came to, to, um, to it. You know, my dad was super like cool, laid back. He wasn't in the comics. My dad was like the traditional, like jock kind of kid. He played all the sports. He, you know, um, served in the military, um, you know, all that kind of jazz. He's like the man's man. He wasn't much in the, you know, like cartoons, video games, the kind of things that I was into. Um, but he was, he was always cool with it. Like if he gave me money and I went and I bought comics, he didn't necessarily under, understand it as much, but he never, um, he never squashed it. He was never like had a problem with it. He was always supportive in a way that if that was, you know, if that was something I was into, he was cool with it. He never said anything against it. 
So it was, it was cool in that way, but it was always a negative connotation. And this is just not me. I mean, a lot of us, we, and we've talked about this and, you know, different things before, like a lot of times when we were younger, I think it's way more acceptable now. And I think like to get into the hobby of collecting and reading comics is way more acceptable now because of movies and TV shows and everything else. You know, for me growing up in the, in the eighties and even early nineties, it was like a taboo thing. Um, collecting comics and you got bullied about it. You got teased, you got ridiculed. Um, it was such a, you know, and even in, um, I just, um, it was weird, you know, like even in black society and black culture, um, it was really frowned upon. Like if you were a comic book nerd, like even a lot of me and my friends, like when we're like in the fourth and fifth grade, like we did it in secret, like in hiding, You know, we made sure, like, when we went to the, like, little gas station in the small town I lived in, you know, that none of the girls were around when we were going to the spinner rack and buying comics. And we would, like, go to each other's house and, like, would read comics and trade them and stuff. And, like, we would hide it away. It was, like, it was, like, so freaking weird. When I look back at it now, it's, like, it was crazy. But, like, it was that serious. Um, You know, to a point where... Like it was such a negative thing. And I caught such negativity, not necessarily for my family. Cause my mom never cared, um, you know, about that. I liked comics or that I read comics. Um, she just loved that. I, I, I attached to something and that it propelled me to read and want to read so much. So she was always cool about that. And I was always kind of, you know, I read it. I, you know, yes, I, this is how nerdy I was. I used to actually read encyclopedias for, uh, fun to learn. And, and my mother always instilled in me because I started reading so early. Um, you know, you know, my mom graduated high school, but she never went off to college. So it was always a thing where like when I started reading comics and, you know, I would see some of these Stanley big words and I would not know what they mean or how to pronounce them. She brought me a set of encyclopedias and she brought me a dictionary. And she said, if you don't know what a word means, look it up and learn it. So that's what I would do. Um, so she always, you know, pushed that, you know, in me and I, you know, so again, like my father, she didn't necessarily get it, but she, she supported it in her own way, um, because she, it helped me to learn It helped me learn a lot of big words. Um, it helped me with my reading and my comprehension and it taught me how to research. And I guess that's why I put so much work in everything I do, because it's like the foundation of my childhood from something as simple as reading comics, the the kind of foundation my mom built around me because she wanted me to understand, you know, because if you're young and you don't have that reinforcement, you might get frustrated because you're trying to read something. You don't know what a word means, or you start pronouncing it wrong. And she was really a stickler about if you're going to learn it, don't skip or skip on it, learn it and say it in correctly. Um, so that was such a foundation of my childhood. And what I remember so much about it, um, you know, but it was funny, like even maybe I think I was 11, 12 years old. Like it was so, I felt so much pressure and negativity around the fact that, um, I still, you know, like certain of my friends, like when they got a certain age, they start hitting their puberty, like they, you know, comics weren't as cool and they kind of dipped out, but I still had a love for comics. I love to draw, um, you know, and I, I, I just, I couldn't turn away from the hobby, but after a while, there was a lot of pressure in to kind of squash it. I felt like, look, if I just like, don't keep all these comics and keep collecting them, you like maybe the, the passion or desire because there's so much negativity around it, you know, like that I get from people in school and stuff like that and getting bullied and teased about it. I was like, if I'm just going to give all my comics away and literally like just one day I gave all my comics. away, I took them out, threw them out. Anybody who wants them. I just gave them away. All the comics, like my cousins had handed down to me. I had a massive collection at, at that point. I gave them all away. And for a couple of years, you know, I, you know, I launched into my preteen and teens and I was good for a while. I was good for a while. And then the whole image boom came and like spawn became a thing. And I'll never forget my, um, my first wife, um, our first date, I asked her to take me to a comic book shop and I bought, I think it was issue six or seven of spawn. I had heard about it and I just wanted to read it. 
And I, yeah, I took it to a comic shop as her because she actually she had a car. I didn't have a car. She had a car, and we were riding by the comic shop. I asked her to stop, and I took her to a comic shop on our first date and bought a Spawn comic. And I think I was like sixteen, seventeen years old, and that basically started me back down into the hobby of, um, uh, down comics and like pretty much until. Um, you know, a couple of years ago when I, I started running out of space for comics, I never stopped collecting from 17, um, you know, until that point. And now I've shifted more to digital, but I never, and like at that point, I accept, you can't accept it no better than you take a girl on a first date and you take her to a comic shop. It was like the point when, you know, as I was older and it was like, this is just me and it's what I'm about. And I finally accepted it. Other people around me started accepting it. And I didn't let anything people said or if they thought it was cool or not um, bother me. And if they asked me what I was reading or why, I would tell them. And I started educating people. And it was funny as I did it, um, more of my friends got more interested in the stories I was reading. Um, you know, for a while, um, I would like give people comics that I thought they would like if I knew them, you know, well enough, like if their birthday or something came up, you know, I gave a lot of like, um, I bought some man- manga, like one of my friends was a huge into Dragon Ball Z. I bought him some manga and he loved it. I bought people like Kingdom Come, um, you know, things like that really huge store, you know, um, you know, Dark Knight Returns and, you know, graphic novels and stuff. And, you know, I, I would do that for a while. And a lot of my friends ended up, you know, being in the comics, you know, because of it, you know, um, I just started spreading that love and, you know, would pick stories that I thought that would me, you know, that would slowly bring them in. And, 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 and during that time we got more and more movies and it became more and more of a thing and it became more and more acceptable. So it was just what it, you know, uh, just what it was. And I'm so glad now, um, that we have things like black lightning. We have Luke. Well, we had Luke Cage before it got canceled, you know, black Panther, we got Falcon and MCU war machine. We're getting, you know, we're getting more women and, you know, lead, lead roles we got captain marvel coming out you know and it's been a lot of you know marvel caught a lot of flack for diversity with different changes they made about female thor and iron heart and even at some points about miles morales and i felt like yeah in certain cases it could have been done better like with miss marvel they made um her name is linked to a lineage but she's an original character she you know because I, I like, well, here's the thing. I say I always seem to like DC better than Marvel when it comes to creating new characters. And, and we it's always been a lineage-based type thing. It's been multiple flashes. It's been multiple Green Lanterns um, and things of that nature. So you can have diversity within that without being so jarring and be like, now we have Jane Foster Thor, but it's Thor. It's like, no, Thor is Thor. She could be a, a, a Asgardian link character but didn't have to be Thor. But again, it's the name and brand recognition that Marvel needs to propel the character. So that's why they do it. And also, you know, you know, people complained and it was all a, b- a bunch of stories about that. And that's neither here or there because we never focus on like negativity, you know, here when it comes to stuff. So it, it was what it was. It was some backlash from store owners and different things like that. Um, but I think Marvel's heart was in the right pr- you know, place. And you need that brand recognition, especially when you're doing something like, because it's risky when you introduce um, those things, because again, it's no one's fault at all. I just think that if you grow up and most of the heroes are a certain archetype, it's going to take work to change the zeitgeist to accept anything different at all it takes a lot of work it because it's just this been the way it is and that's when i looked at it, it was like that was just the way it was those were the big heroes that were on everything with superman batman spider-man they're all caucasian males you know what i'm saying into the spider-verse was one of the most as as if revolutionary and as important as black panther was a year ago because you saw a, a, a diverse cast of you know, um, Miles being uh, African American and Latino, and his mom being all Latino, his father being African American, then he, his uncle and 
And then, you know, and you had the diversity of the kingpin and being in the movie, you know, it's like, if we need more of that and we're getting that and, and people are more accepting to it and they're putting their money behind it to support it. So now Hollywood can feel more and more comfortable with it. We didn't just have black Panther. We didn't just have into the spider verse. We look at, we look at the success of, um, uh, also of black lightning on CW, which is a great show. We see even outside of the, of comic industry where we see things like crazy rich Asians that's opening up the door for that. So then we can get more, um, more inclusion, which is what we need. It, you know, the whole reason, and I don't talk about it a lot, but the whole reason I started a podcast was really selfish. I did it because when I was, when I, when I got into the whole podcast and listening to podcast thing. I was frustrated because I did not hear others like me. When I saw video podcasts in the early day, it was a handful of them. I didn't see people that looked like me and it bothered me because I was like, does society think that number one, African-Americans don't read comics because I know we do because I do. And I have a ton of friends that do. So what bothered me is I said, well, why isn't someone doing that to, cause it was always a stereotype and it bothered me to my soul. So I was like, okay. And I researched it and I found one podcaster at that time that was African-American that was doing a podcast and it was Derek Coward doing comic book noise, which he still does to this day. He mentored me and helped me create my show for me to get started. He pulled me under his wing. He taught me the ropes. I reached out to Comic Geek Speak, which they had a round table. They had, they got Caucasian guys. They had Latino guys. Patrick Rios. One of, you know, still cool with him to this day. The whole, the whole round table of the guys over at, you know, Comic Brian Deemer, all the, you know, original cast of guys there were tremendous. They took me under their wing and helped me as well. And, and once I saw that, I was like, you know, it was never about race after that point. It was like, you know, I, I wanted to represent to be like, you know, just like Derek showed me, it was like, we can be comic book fans and into it just as heavily as every, everyone else and could talk about it intelligently um, and be just as nerdy as everyone else. So I did it as a representation thing as thought that launched me down the path to create it. But then after I, I did it, I was like, I just love comics and I want to talk comics to other comics fans and race was never anything I brought up, you know, ever again, really in the course of doing the, the podcast, even to this day, that's why I was so conflicted about doing this episode, but it was just, and you know, like certain things will nag at you and you know, you have to do it and you have to talk about it. And it bothered me for the whole year like that I didn't do I was like I'm scared to to talk about this and I'm like why because it bothers me and I gotta get it off my chest you know because I was ashamed of myself more so than anybody else <laughs> but it's not you know we need to get better about knowing all of us not just me we all need to get better about knowing about you know, different pockets and different characters and different diversity and different cultures in, in, in comics, you know, and read a little bit more about it and research a little bit more, uh, about it because it, it, they're very interesting characters. Some that just got left, you know, on, you know, the cutting room floor that need to be picked back up and polished up. Like Luke Cage has been around for a long time. They really wasn't doing anything with Luke Cage until, Brian Michael Bendis, like we wouldn't have Luke Cage being as prominent now as he was if it wasn't for him picking up that character and doing something with it. Let's be honest. Um, so this was just was on my mind. It was on my heart. I wanted to talk about it. I don't know if it even made sense, but it was something I just felt like I had to do. I had to talk about it. I don't know if you agree with me, if you understand where I'm coming from. Um, but it was just something I had to do. Um, you know, and I, and another thing too, I, I didn't want it to be like, well, it's black history month. It's like a big thing. I came up with it over a year ago before February even came. And like I said, I sat on it because I was just conflicted about 
how I talk about it. How do I do it? I don't want to offend anybody. Um, but I just feel a certain way, you know, and it just made me look at my own history and how little I knew. And, you know, that I have to do more work and learn about these characters and learn about the history of even, even, um, contributors, you know, um, as artists, you know, and writers in, you know, the history of the comic book industry as well and the impact they've made. Do we hear many people acknowledge it? You know, um, so it's a lot of work that still needs to be done and, 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 and diversity as well, when it comes to more women, you know, more, I mean, you know, we have, um, we have LGBT, you know, community. It's so much out there that needs to be represented. We need a realistic representation of society in the comics world, just as much as we do in the real world. And I hope maybe by me talking about this, I don't know that it helps open up conversation or even thought. I don't know, but it is what it is. You know, I don't even know what else to say. Um, that's all I have for you guys for this episode. Um, check out the website, follow me on social media. I'll talk to you guys next time. Have a good week, and I'll see you for the next episode of Comic Book Savant. Okay, I had to, sorry about that. I had to gather myself. I got emotional. I don't know why. I guess maybe it's just been something that's been weighing on me for a long time to to say. Um, And it's funny because I don't script what I say. You know, I write down bullet points, and I, I just... I talk from my heart and from my head and sometimes I worry about when you guys listen, does it make any sense what I'm saying at all? Because it's, it, sometimes it, it's so much that I want to express about my thoughts and feelings about things. Sometimes I don't know how easily it comes out and then it, it becomes a mess. But, um, you know, like I said, this is more, um, I didn't have any, uh, agenda or anything behind this. It was just, like I said, it was something that uh, when it came up made me think and it made me look at how things were um, and how much knowledge I lacked in the area. And I wanted to talk about it to you guys, the community, my fam, my extended family about it, about how I felt about myself when it came to it. And maybe it'll shed some light on maybe I need to, you know, read more um diverse characters or, or, or look into other, you know, pockets of comics. Maybe it'll spark something in yourself that'll lead you to explore. That's mainly what this was all about and giving some of my background, um, in my journey to where it kind of got me to this point. Um, that's all. And that's it. I had to come back on here to, to make sure I got that point across and also had to talk about some stuff because I need your money because I ain't got no sponsor no more. So with that being said, um, definitely if you, you know, I, you guys have been so supportive retweeting. I, I'm seeing the retweets. I know I've been horrible on Twitter. I'm trying to get better. Twitter is so intimidating. I might need some of y'all to um, hit me up and to coach me and to teach me Twitter because I suck at it. Um, just point blank. I'm trying to get better and figuring it out and how to post more outside of just posting new episodes or coming out and interact with you guys more through, uh, through Twitter. Um, also we have the Patreon. If you haven't checked it out by now, um, definitely if you, you know, you can, not everyone can financially support, you know, help support the show. But again, we have, I have tiers on the Patreon starting at a dollar level that gives you um, access to additional content, like the comic books, um, to my extra, um, podcast that I was doing here. Um, you can find, uh, the Patreon site at patreon.com forward slash comic books of on. It is P A T R e o n dot com forward slash comic books of art, all one word again we have tiers um from one dollar three dollars five dollars and the highest tier seven dollars a month and you have different perks and benefits depending on on the tier um that you contribute to uh per month you can you know you can start and stop it at any time um and it's some really good perks uh it's a lot of 
additional content there. It's like a ton. I've been building up the Patreon campaign as I've been getting more uh, patrons uh, coming over. So again, it's one way I definitely can use your support. Like I said, I no longer have a sponsor for the episodes. So uh, needs your support to help keep this ship going in the forward direction. Uh, so definitely, if you have a moment, check it out. Um, if not, keep retweeting. Because like I said, I know everyone financially can't throw uh, money to support their favorite show. If you can, I greatly appreciate it. If not, keep retweeting, uh, you know, um, sharing the content. Also, you can go over if you haven't already. I'm pushing to try to get a thousand subscribers on YouTube by the end of 2019. We broke, um, we broke past 200. We're like at 220 or something like that now. So we're going slowly, but surely we got a long way to go. But if you haven't already, subscribe. If you um, share the content, share it with other people that might be comic fans and tell them to go subscribe to the YouTube channel. Tell them to come over here to um, iTunes or through their favorite um, podcatcher and, and subscribe to the podcast there as well. Because it's different content on YouTube than it is here. So they can get all the comic book goodness they want. I really appreciate all your guys' support and let me sit here and cry like a baby on the microphone. Um, again, you accept me for me, which made me feel more comfortable in doing this episode and and getting this off my chest. I feel a ton better now because I, I talked about it and just what bothered me and why it bothered me. Um, I thank you guys for that because you allow me to be 100% me. Um, I did rebranding for the show because for the longest time, the tagline to the comic books of my podcast was uh, the podcast for this. Uh, what was it? The podcast for the serious comics fan. And I'm on some different stuff now. I've been on some different stuff for a while. But what I'm doing here and what I'm doing on YouTube is this what I'm doing. I feel like I'm doing as a as a brand of comic book savant is that it's about comics and it's for the love of comics. Heath, I had a long thing and it was just so corny and he that I was talking to Heath and I was running it by him. He's like, it needs to be simpler. It needs to be more concise. And he was like, well, you're really doing it. He was like, well, what is it that you really want to portray? It's like that. I love comics. He's like, well, there you have it. It's like for the love of comics. So now comic books is all for the love of comics. And I appreciate and I love you guys for allowing me to do it for the love of comics. Now, just give me a little bit of your money and we'd be good to go. <laughs> but uh, with all that being said, I'm actually finally signing out for this episode. I thank you again for your support. And I will see you guys next week for another episode of Comic Book Savant. And don't forget to go over and check out um, Heath on YouTube, youtube.com, Serial at Midnight. And then also the website is serialatmidnight.com. Check it out. Great content there as well. I will see you guys next week for another episode. And you guys take care. Love you. See you soon.